Hope, uh, hope you are having fun. So it's great uh, coming here and see uh, this crowd of students, of people who want to come and learn about uh, Gaussian processes. So it's, it's been a few years since we, we've been doing this. And I think now, so what I was thinking yesterday is that somehow life is what happened between Gaussian process summer schools, right? It's like one year after the other. So, OK, so hope you are having fun. Hope you are learning a lot about Gaussian processes. and. Hope you are also having fun during the beer tasting. That's that's one of the most important parts of the summer school because you can have very good ideas while trying one different different type of beers, right? Uh, so uh, today we're going to talk about uh, Bayesian optimization for the next uh, hour and a half. Um, uh, beyond what you can do with Bayesian optimization, I think the the most important thing uh, that I want you to take home from 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 this presentation is how you can use uncertainty to make decisions, how you can uh, use Gaussian processes and probabilistic models and use the uncertainty that comes from those models to make informed decisions uh, in, in, in different aspects of, 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 of machine learning and in different problems that, that you can face. So I'm going to start a bit uh, philosophical, the, the, the talk. So um, I just brought this sentence that says, um, civilization advances by extending the number of important operations which we can perform without thinking of them. Right? So I think this is a good example, and I think this sentence is at, at the core of what we try to do with, with machine learning, that is uh, automation, and at the core of what we are trying to do in, in, in this talk as well. Right? So we are going to be in, in interested in two main aspects of, of automation. One is, well, how do we do automatic model configuration? And when I talk about automatic model configuration, and I'm talking about, well, I have this data set, I have this problem, or I have a, an answer, I, I have a question I want, to, I want to answer, how do I select the best model? Um, that can be, well, I have a big class of model, I just want to do model selection, or imagine that you have already selected your model, and what you want to do is to tune the parameters of that model for that particular, for that particular problem. The second uh, thing that, that we will be touching will be automatic experimental, automatic experimental design. So we will be thinking, well, if I need to collect data to answer a question, how should I come up with an automated procedure to do that in an in a efficient and in, in, in a good way? Right? So this is uh, what going, we're, we're going to try to do today. And just to uh, set a bit the, the scene, so if you think about, about data science, so you can think about machine learning like one step that you can take when you do data science, right? But you can think about data science like something that is even bigger than machine learning because, well, and maybe every one of you can think about different steps um, uh, that you have to take when doing data science, but more or less I think we can agree when, when you do data science you have some, some data collection that you, that you have to do, you, maybe you want to uh, do some feature extraction, you do some modeling, you select your algorithm, you have some results, um, maybe what you want is to interpret those results, right, just to show them to someone. Or if you, what you are doing is to implement in a pipeline in an autonomous system, maybe what you want to do is to get something that you learn from the environment and from those data and do some sort of informed learning and collect new data and making new decisions, right? So the, 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 where I'm going with, with this slide is that, well, we have, we have to, when we do data science, we have, we have to make decisions, right? And in some cases, we want to be intervening in those decisions, right? I mean, we are humans, we, we are creative people, and we can, we, can do, uh, we can try different models, we can come up with, with, new, with, the, with new models, with new algorithms, but in some cases what we want to do is to do things in an automatic way, right? So maybe I just want to come up with an automatic procedure of extracting the best features from my data set, or as I was saying before, I can select the best algorithm, right? So the point of this, of this talk, and, and what I'm trying to say here is that Many of these problems, and as you already probably know, can be represented as optimization problems, right? So if I want to automate a decision, I define an objective function and over whatever. It can be over some criterion I want to satisfy when designing an experiment, over a measure of goodness of my algorithm. I write this like an optimization problem, and if I solve it, I have automated my decision, right? So when I'm the type of optimization problems we are going to be talking about today are optimization problems of this type, right? So we are going to consider that we are going to have some, some sort of well-behaved, and this is a bit vague, but what I mean by well-behaved will be some uh, continuous function that will be differentiable. I mean, all these things can be relaxed, but this is just a general term that I want to use here. The function is going to be the same in some uh, subset 
of Rd. This can also be generalized, and I'll, I'll show you later. And the point is, well, I want to find the location where that function takes the minimum value, right? If you think about maximizing, that's the same problem. I just take the mean, the max of minus f is basically the, the same problem, right? If, if what you want to do is, is to do maximization. Right, so this, this problem is, is very easy when we have an explicit form of f that is defined in a in a low dimensional space. We, we all do this when we are in the school. We take f, we take the derivative, the critical points, and we find the, 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 the minimum of f. But the interesting bit here is the conditions that we are going to impose on f that are going to represent many of these classes of problems that I was mentioning before that will allow us to do automation when we do data science and when we do machine learning. First, f, we are going to f that we are going to assume that f is explicitly unknown. That means that we are going to optimize something that we don't have explicitly represented in a piece of paper. So we don't know the expression of f. The only thing we have is we have a mechanism of querying f in certain points in the domain, right? But this is this can be okay. Well, if I can do that, I'm, I, I can I can query f in many many points, so I almost have f. We will see that we cannot do that because evaluating f in points in the domains is going to be very, very expensive, right? So we'll have, we're going to have a budget. We, we will only be able to do that in, a, in a, a, few, a few number of times, right? And also, we are going to have problems like, well, f may be exact. So whenever I query f uh, at x, I can get f of x, or I can get f of x plus some, some noise, right? So this is, this is a hypothesis. This is, this is the, the problem that, that, that we want to solve. Why is this important? I mean, uh, I hope you, you already uh, can think about examples in which you have problems like this. A uh, very prominent example now in the machine learning community is, well, I have a neural network, and what I want to do is to tune the neural network. If I'm training this neural network uh, in, a, in, a, in a massive data set, I can try different configurations of the neural network. I can come up with some uh, mean uh, prediction error. But every time I, I train the neural network, that's going to take a lot of time, right? So how do I configure that? How do I configure the number of hidden layers that I have? How do, how do I select the, the best model here? That's, that's an example of, of something that um, uh, represents a, 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 a very expensive function that you don't have explicitly written, but that you would like, that you would like to optimize. Uh, by the way, feel free to stop me if you, if you want. So uh, this is just another example. So imagine that you want to find paths uh, across different points in, in the city, and you have to identify the best landmarks that are going to take you from point A to point B in the minimum amount of time, right? And imagine that you also have a dynamic system that uh, the city the city is changing, and, and, and you want and you want to do that, right? So that's going to be that's going to be expensive because you may not be able to predict the time that it will take. You maybe need someone to go from one place to the other and to come up with a model to represent that. So and you you want to minimize the, the amount of time that 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 you do that. And so these are just just two examples. But you can think about, about, about many of them. So you can think about things in, in robotics, in brainstorming learning, right? So when you're trying something with a, with a robot arm, you, you, you have a limited amount of time for doing that, right? So you are optimizing something. You are optimizing the, the, the amount of, of, of packages that you pick. Then uh, uh, you can do a limited number of experiments when you do scheduling and planning. Uh, this is a, a very interesting application compil compilers, right? So imagine that you are writing your code, and in a way you can parameterize the code you write. And so what you want to do is to minimize the compiling time of the code, right? So you can think about this piece of code that is giving you an, an output. In this case, is the time that you want to minimize. So you can think about ways of how to re rewrite the code in a, in a more efficient and automatic way. Industrial design. And from those of you mainly coming from the statistical community, you can think about intractable likelihoods. There are some very interesting connections between Bayesian optimization and what we are going to see, an approximate Bayesian computation and, and this type of methods. So this is, uh, this, is the, this is the problem. This is the scene that we have just set up. Um, so what do you do? So I guess now you all are thinking, I hope, uh, that you are thinking about this type of problem. So wh wh what do you do? So, so if, if you want to use a neural network um, and you don't know so much because you just, you're just starting to, 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 to learn about it, 
how do, how do you select the configuration of a neural network? Well, uh, you can just go and ask, right? You can read papers and say, well, for this particular problem, I think this type of networks are going to work. So you just go and use it and, and see what happens, right? So it doesn't sound very, sorry, ooh, next slide. Uh, so it doesn't sound uh, maybe very, very scientific in a way, but that's something that we all have used at some point, right? OK, but we, 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 what we want to do here is this, to formalize this process here. So this is not a, a valid solution for us, because what we want to do is, well, if I have two types of neural networks or two types of models, I want an automatic way of configuring them all, because I want to compare them in a sensible way without human intervention, right? I really want to know what, what's, what's, what's the best configuration here. OK, something we can do, imagine that what we have, we have, a, we have an algorithm. Um, imagine that we, that we have a parameter set that we want to configure, right? And we say, OK, so we are going to assume that um, the objective function that we want to optimize is leaps it, leaps it continu continues. Uh, we are going to mention this term a few times. So just to remember you, so a uh, function is Lipschitz continuous is uh, basically a function that you can say that you can bound the outputs giving a constant, a positive constant times the distance between the inputs, right? So if I know the distance between two inputs and some positive constant, I know that I can bound the output. That, that's all we are saying when we say that the function is Lipschitz continuous and say, OK, so imagine that you have um, a problem in dimension d uh, that is defined in the unit hypercube, right? Um, what we want to do is, well, imagine that this is the true minimum of the function. Um, this is, uh, these are proposals of the function that, that we have, right? And, and epsilon is the tolerance. Is well, if we want to give the mini we want to give a solution of the problem whose distance in the output from the value of the minimum is smaller than epsilon, right? OK, we can try to do a grid search in this problem. But if we really want to warranty a solution there, you, we really want to propose a, 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 um, a minimum that satisfies this condition here, so that is epsilon close to the, to the true minimum, if we, we need to do this number of evaluations in the grid, right? So L is the value of this Lipschitz constant, epsilon is this tolerance, and d is the dimension of the problem. So just for giving you an example, so if we are, a, if, if the Lipschitz constant has value 10, so we can bound the distance between the output as 10 times the distance between the inputs, if this is the tolerance, which is not very great, and we are in a problem of dimension 5, this is the number of evaluations that we need, right? So this is what happened when we tried to do grid search. And one of the hypotheses that we had is that the function is very expensive to evaluate. So this is really something that doesn't make sense in, in the type of problems that we want to solve, right? OK. So Yeah. So this is this is the this is how close we want to warranty that we give a solution that is at, uh, at maximum epsilon uh, at epsilon distance, yeah. right? So we are splitting the hip hypercube and say, okay, we want to explore the hypercube. We are going to create a very fine grid, and we need this number of evaluations if we want to hit that solution. Yeah. Okay. So th that's just just an example. I say, okay. Okay. So grid search doesn't work for us. Uh, so let's try to do things um, at random, right? So we say, okay, let's let's random some points in the domain, um, and 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 let's evaluate the function in, in those locations. That can work better in 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 some uh, scenarios. That can work better than just doing the grid search, but that has some problems as well because there is no intelligence when th that we are putting there when we are doing the random search, right? And there are some interesting cases in which doing just random search in the space can work. Uh, there is something that is called hyperband that is actually based on that. Um, but that's a, a, another discussion. Um, especially when you have uh, additive function, doing things at random uh, should work better than doing things in aggregate. But if you want to see the details of that, you can, you can have a look to, to this reference. right? But the question here is, well, we, we are not considering in any of these policies what we actually know about the problem, what, what we know about, about Gaussian processes, right? And that's what we want to use here. And, and so the question is, well, can, can we do better? Can we, can we come up with, a, with another formalism that will allow us to reduce this number and to do the search 
of the minimum of a function in, in a better way, right? So that's, that's what we are going to do. So this is uh, a small game that I have prepared for you. Um, so we, what we want to do here is to resemble the, the situation of the problem that we want to solve in a, in a very small example. So I'm going to ask you to participate on, on, on this example. So I'm going to give you some information about a function that, that we want to minimize. And what I'm telling you is that, well, this function is um, a continuous function defined in the interval 0, 1. Uh, the function is continuous and differentiable. Uh, the function is not only continuous, but it's Lipschitz continuous. So now you know that this, this thing holds, right? And the third thing I'm telling you about the function is that we have collected four evaluations, and the evaluations are exact. So f of x is exactly f of x, and there is no noise there, right? So this is, this is the, the information I'm giving you about the problem, and this is a representation of the problem, right? So this is my interval 0, 1. My function is happening somewhere there, but, but we don't know it. These are my four evaluations. And now I'm asking myself and I'm asking you two questions. First, given the information that I've given you, where is the minimum of the function? And the second question is, well, assuming that you could take another evaluation of the function, where would you take it? So let's go one by one. So with the information that I just, just gave you, where do you think the minimum of the function is? So imagine that you have 100 pounds, and you have to bet in a point in this domain about the minimum of it. Where, where, where would you put your money? In what point in the interval 0, 1 you would put your money? 0 0.7? 0 .7? Uh, somewhere around here? Well, right? 0 .5? Ooh. So who, who, does, does anyone think that the, that the minimum of the function is right here? How many? How many of you? One, two. Uh, so who thinks the minimum of the function is, is in this interval here? Wow, many people. Anyone, anyone thinks it's here, right? OK. So for those of you, <laughs> you can't, we don't know yet. We don't know yet. So, so for those of you, so I'm, I'm going to take one, one of you, one of the group uh, who was saying that the minimum of the function is here. And I'm, and I'm, trying, I'm going to enter in your mind. And I'm going to try to see what is happening. So I guess what happens is that the, with the information that I just gave you, you imagine a function, right? So imagine some continuous function coming through the points. And you say, OK, well, the function is going down here. So probably the minimum is somewhere over here. And then it recovers and it goes like that. So, so I'm, I'm going to assume that the function that one of you were imagining was something like this, right? So goes, goes down, the minimum is here, right? So what I'm doing is, so I'm, I just plot this imaginary function there. And here, I'm just counting, right? So I'm just saying, I'm just plotting the histogram of the minimum of that function that we just generated. So I know the minimum is here, so I just count one here, right? But you have different answers, right? So every one of you, each of you was, were generating a different function in your mind, right? So I can keep asking, and I can keep generating different functions, right? And I can keep building this histogram of the location of the minimum of this function that you have that you have generated, right? So, but I keep asking um, with the information that I, I just gave you. You generate more functions and more and more. And look, look what is happening, right? So, that's the only thing I did. So, I gave you some information about the function. We collected four observations. Each one of you were generating one of these functions that are coherent with the hypothesis that that we had about it. And the only thing that we did was to collect the locations of the minimum and to draw an histogram, right? So look what this, this histogram is telling us. So this, what this histogram is telling us is like, well, no one thinks that the minimum of the function is actually here, right? Because well, we got this value, this is very high, so no, nothing is going to happen. Many of you were thinking that the minimum of the value was actually around the, collect, the, the, the best uh, collected point, right? And then, so where I'm going here is that actually the samples that you were generating by collecting the minimum, you were working as a generative process of possible functions that we are trying to optimize. And what we just did is with those samples, we built an, op an object that now is giving us the information that the group was generating 
about its minimum value, right? So now we can, we, can, we can take the limit of that, and we can say, well, imagine that we could ask infinitely many people about the same question. Infinitely many people will be generating these samples, and we can take the limit. Um, imagine that what we could do is to recover a probability distribution over the minimum of the function that we are trying to optimize, right? This is what we are trying to do. So, you were samples of a generative model that, as you can imagine, is going to be a Gaussian process. What we are going to do is we are going to fit that generative model and to build an object that is going to help us to make decisions about the information of the minimum, right? About, about the location of the minimum. And now we can, we can do a lot of things with this probability distribution. This is just one way that we can do it. And I'll, I'm going to show you many ways in which you can, you can use the distribution. But at the core of what we are doing here is that, remember that at the beginning we have, oh, we have this optimization problem that looks very hard to solve because we have this object that we cannot even query. We are just evaluating it in a few points. So what we say is, okay, let's, let's change the game. Let's change the game. Let's treat this optimization problem like a decision problem. It's a decision problem because I told you, well, if you have budget to collect a new evaluation, where would you take it? That's the decision problem. But the game that we just play by generating the samples and deriving the distribution of the minimum, what we are actually doing is we are treating that decision problem as inference. What we're going to do is what we know about probability, what we know about Gaussian process, what we know about modeling the epistemic uncertainty that we have about the problems to solve the original optimization problem that we had, that remember, it can be a deterministic problem. So we are going to use probability to solve a problem that was deterministic. The reason why we are doing that is because we are modeling our uncertainty about the problem through the model that we are using. And that's um, what we typically uh, using in uncertainty quantification that, that Rich was mentioned. So we are replacing the original deterministic function by a probabilistic model that will help us to make decisions about it. OK? Any question? Till here? It's all clear? No questions? OK. So, so this is, uh, so this is the, the, the general idea of what is called surrogate modeling. Um, a surrogate modeling for, for optimization. And as, as, so we saw before that we, we derive the, the probability distribution over the minimum, right? Um, and we say, okay, this is, this is going to be interesting for us for making decisions about where the minimum is, about where to collect new evaluations. You have to keep in mind that whenever you build an utility and functions of the probability distribution over the minimum is just an utility for solving an optimization problem, um, your utility should represent what you want to solve about the problem. In this case, we are interested on minimizing the function. So, yeah, to compute the distribution over the minimum sounds interesting, right? But imagine that you have other objectives, right? So imagine that your objective is simply to collect points in a way that you know more and more about the entire object, you know more and more about the entire function, right? Then you will go for things like, well, like, like active learning, right? So when you do active learning, you have this probabilistic model about a process of interest. And what you do is to collect points in a way that you reduce uncertainty about it, global uncertainty, right? Here, we're interested in reducing global uncertainty, but also knowing about, the about where the minimum is. So we will be combining this trade-off that we will be discussing later, that is exploration and exploitation. So if I just reduce uncertainty, I just want to explore. I don't know what is going on in different regions in the domain. I collect points, I reduce uncertainty, and I'm happy with that, right? Now I want to combine that with knowing about a particular feature of the function that is the location of the minimum. So I have to combine that exploration uh, phase that allows me to know about the process with specifically collecting knowledge about the minimum of the function. So that's why, so in active learning, you have some type of utility functions. In Bayesian optimization, you have other type of utility functions. And typically what is used in Bayesian optimization is what is called um, cumulative regret. So remember, this is the, the minimum, the global minimum of the function for definition. And what we are going to do is to come up with sequence of evaluations of the function such that the cumulative regret is minimized. So what we want to do is propose a sequence of x such that this 
quantity is minimized. Why is that? Because, well, if this was already the minimum, this will be zero, and that will be the optimal solution. But we are going to incur in a loss because we are not going to hit the minimum from the, from the very beginning because we don't know where it is, right? That, that, that's the problem. So uh, the, the take home message is that you can generalize everything we are going to talk about, thinking about what do you need to solve in your problem, and you can connect these ideas with, with, other, with other fields, right? Now focusing on, on, on Bayesian optimization, um, so I, I told you at the beginning, that because uh, there was this typo in the date that we were going to talk about uh, methods for the future, but if you look at the, da at, at, at the date of what I'm citing here in my first format slide about basic optimization is 1978. So now you're probably thinking, what the hell, what's this guy talking about? He's talking about ancient Rome in terms of the technique that we are going to use. Yes. These ideas have been out there for many years, but there are different reasons why they haven't been exploited in the machine learning community and, and, and also in stats. In stats, a bit more, but uh, I'll discuss that later. So just summarizing the steps. Now we have this function that we want to optimize, f. We're going to have some prior measure, right? Some, some probabilistic model. What, what is that going to be? That's going to be a Gaussian process. That's not very surprising. You will see why. We're going to combine that with data, right? And then you, we are going to use the model to build this loss function, acquisition function, utility function. All these are names for the, for the same thing, right? <laughs> depending on the context, depending on the area where you read about this, you will, you will see that these terms are used, but they are, they are basically the same thing. I typically like using acquisition function, but uh, you, can, you can use other names. So we build the model, we collect data, we are going to use this acquisition function to make decisions about the next location. We augment the data and we repeat the process over and over uh, until we don't have more points to collect. Basically, that's, that's the idea of, of Bayesian optimization. Um, so this is a this is a, a slide uh, I used to summarize Gaussian process in just one slide. So this is um, so this is a this is on prior measure over over functions. And what I'm drawing here are samples from, from the corresponding GP. So originally I got this idea from, from Philip Hennig. And what I'm doing here is basically, so imagine that you have a multivariate Gaussian of dimension two. This is a Gaussian process, so it's an infinitely dimensional multivariate Gaussian. So I'm just uh, taking a sample, and what you are seeing here are draws of the sample that are equidistant to the, to the center of the distribution. That's why you have this repeated pattern. I just want to illustrate this, are the, this is the confidence band of the Gaussian process. These are samples from the prior. These are samples from the posterior that are passing through the points that I have, that I have just collected, right? And as you know, a Gaussian process is defined by a covariance function and some mean that in the prior we assume to be zero. And you know that when you marginalize this to some finite set of points, what you get is a multivariate Gaussian, right? So you already know that. Uh, but that's something that we are going to use a lot when, when doing Bayesian optimization, right? So we were talking about exploration, exploitation, right? So what is that? Um, that's something that, that we use every day. That, that's something that we use um, in pretty much every decision that we make. Because I, I really like this paper over there. That's a NIST paper in 2013. It's a, it's a very applied paper. I think it's is, is written by, by psychologists. And what they were trying to show is how this way of solving an optimization problem and making decisions resembles very well what humans do when making decisions as well. Because so imagine that you go to your favorite restaurant, right? Um, so when you go to, to your favorite restaurant, you have a prior about the level of satisfaction that you are going to get when choosing a particular meal, right? So you say, well, I really like tacos in this Mexican restaurant, so I'm gonna go for that because my prior is telling me that if I like tacos and they have tacos, I'm going to like that, right? So you can, you, but it comes to the point where you have to make the decision, right? So you can decide to, do, to be very exploitative, what is called, exploitative and go for something that you know is going to be good and, and uh, up, up to some level. Or you can say, oh, I'm going to explore today. I, I really, I, I don't care. I'm going to try something new. And when you try something new, two things can happen. The, what you get was very bad, and you say, no, I should keep eating tacos. Or what you get was very good, right? 
So you never know when you explore new things if that's going to be for good or for bad. But that's something that is not bad to do sometimes, right? So when we make decisions, we are doing that all the time. And what they saw in this paper is basically that they, they did uh, an experiment with people in which they asked them with some budget to optimize uh, some functions that they had in the screen, like the game that we were playing before. And they saw that from every optimization method that they try, and they try many, the, one, the humans were doing the best in the experiments. But the only method that was close to the results that humans were getting was Bayesian optimization. And, and they were given arguments to say that it's because of, of the reason that I just mentioned, that it's really working like, um, uh, like human things with this process of updating a prior, collecting data, and, and, changing, and changing our decisions. Right? But exploration and exploitation, the reason I brought this here is because any acquisition function should be a balance of these two terms. Right? And that's where the uncertainty comes. So exploitation is what we know, is the mean of the Gaussian process. Uh, exploration is what we don't know about the process, is the variance of, a, of, of the Gaussian process. Right? So how do we smartly combine these two terms to come up with a good policy that combines these two things that will give the maximum level of satisfaction that we get when we go to a restaurant forever? That's what we're going to do here. Right? So later we will see uh, how you can do basic optimization in batches as well. So instead of selecting that just one plate, you can select multiple of them. So that's like going to Spain and having some tapas, right? In just, just one, you get many of them, right? That, but that's, we'll discuss that later. We are not close to the last time, so it's OK. So what do we do? We want to balance exploration, exploitation. Remember that we are minimizing the function, right? So minimizing the function means that exploitation comes but minus the mean, right? Because that's what we want to do. So this is the this is the this is the Gaussian process in the in the four points that I just saw you. Um, so this is an acquisition function that is called lower confidence bound. So well it's known as upper confidence bound but when you use it for maximizing. Here we are minimizing. We are calling it lower confidence bound. The only thing we are doing is we are taking the mean we are taking the standard deviation, and we are not taking the variance because we want these two guys to be in the same units, basically. We weight the standard deviation by some positive parameters, and that's it. That's our acquisition, right? So the larger beta is, the more explorative I'm going to be, because I'm giving more weight to the, to the standard deviation. If I drop this to zero, I'm going to be completely myopic. I'm just going to use the mean. Right? I will just take the minimum value here, right? So that's that's a that's a that's a very simple but very easy to understand acquisition function in terms of exploration and exploitation, right? And it's also interesting because when you do that, and when, uh, there there is a lot of theory that you can that you can do with it, with this acquisition function because pretty much when you have exact evaluations of the function, this object here is bounding the function that you are trying to optimize. And because you can bound the function, you can make some hypotheses, and also bound the minimum of the function, and to approximate the cumulative regret that you have, and, and do a lot of maths, um, um, and, very interesting, and having very interesting results with that. Um, something I wanted to say here as well is, look, if, if, you, if you take this term, and you remove it from this equation, what you have is that you are only optimizing the standard deviation, right? So this is a very nice way of connecting what you do when Bayesian optimization with what you do with active learning. When you do active learning, what you want to do is just to reduce uncertainty, right? So you want to drop this term over here. So it's like, this is like just going to the restaurant and just getting some things at random, right? Th things that you don't know, that, that's what you try, right? But this is the connection with, with active learning. You can, you can do it from this acquisition. As I was saying before, you can do some maths. You can bound the cumulative regret. So this is just uh, uh, something I, I, I took from, from, the, from, from the paper. This is the main theorem of the paper. And say, well, under certain conditions, I can, and for some adaptive parameter beta, I can bound the cumulative, I can bound the cumulative regret with certain probability. Right? Um, so that's, that's basically it. So this is an acquisition function that you can use. 
So in practice, so this is very this acquisition function is is very nice for 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 doing theory about Bayesian optimization, but in practice, it's not what you would like to use, because it's typically overconfident about these bounds. Right? These are bounds, but when you use it, it typically doesn't work as as you expected. Uh, but that's the thing. So this is uh, the famous expected improvement. This is probably the uh, most used uh, acquisition in practice. And the reason is because it works well in practice. It's very easy to implement and also very easy to understand. So what we are doing here is, well, imagine that we have our Gaussian process and we have the point where we have uh, the best uh, carbon evaluation, right? The only thing we are doing is to compute the expected maximum of this difference here. So we have the maximum of zero or the y best minus y, where I'm integrating y uh, with the posterior distribution of the GP that we know is Gaussian. So that means that we have closed form for this. And what I'm computing is in each point of the domain, the expected gain, the expected improvement that I, that I will have with respect to my carbon best, right? So if I go here, I don't expect to gain anything because I'm so far from the minimum with this evaluation that nothing is really going to happen. So the expected improvement is zero. The expected improvement is telling me, yeah, don't collect evaluation here because it's not going to be any good. But around the point, the expected improvement is telling me that I should spend some, some evaluations in some points over here, right? These are still good enough, and they have large enough uncertainty that the acquisition is telling me maybe you should spend some evaluations there. The good thing about expected improvement, it has closed form, it gradients has closed form, so they are very easy to implement and use. The only problem is that it tends to be a bit over-explorative, right? So if you have a problem with multiple nodes, it may happen that you are going to fall in a, in a local uh, minimum as well. Uh, you, ha you can do some, some theory about the, the expected improvement. There is, there is some, nice, some nice results as well. So I would say that this is the, the most popular acquisition. And if you have this problem of that, that is over, over exploitative in some problems, you can also add some jitter parameters to try to correct that. But this is tricky to select. This is a positive constant. How do you select that? It's not, it's not, it's not trivial. So that means that, well, you, you see, the, the, the acquisition you select de depends on the problem. We are, we are going to discuss later different uh, different ways of selecting acquisitions with, with, other, with other criteria, but remember that when you select an acquisition, you are specifying an exploration exploitation trade-off, right? And, 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 and this is up to you, and, th and that's, that's all you are doing. And you have to combine the exploration exploitation that the acquisition is giving you with the way you are calibrating the uncertainty with the model, because those things come together, right? Because imagine the following example, imagine that you have a model, you have expected improvement, imagine that you change the model, and now you use a, a random forest on, or a patient network, and you keep the same acquisition function, you are changing the exploration exploitation trade-off, because your model may be calibrating the uncertainty in a different way, because you are using a Bayesian model, it's, it's your uncertainty, right? So it's, it's an epistemic and biased uncertainty that you are selecting when selecting a particular model. So you have to be very careful, very careful with that. So another acquisition function. So previous acquisition functions were deterministic. So given the model, you have an exact form of the, of the acquisition. And this is a very interesting one. It's, it's called Thompson sampling. Um, it's also called probability matching. And it's based on taking a sample from the GP. And in this case, just, uh, well, what I'm assuming is that I'm maximizing the acquisition function. The next point that I'm collecting is, the point where I maximize the acquisition function. So that's why I'm getting a sample from the GP. What I'm drawing here is minus the sample, and I'm maximizing it. I know it's a bit stupid, but it's just for, the, uh, for coherence with the, with, the, with the rest of the presentation, right? So I draw a sample, and I get this one. And now the question is, well, if you were drawing another sample, you will, you, you will be deciding another location. And that's absolutely correct. That's why it's a random acquisition function. But if you think about it, this Ran these random samples themselves, they contain the exploration exploitation trade-off, right? Because no sample, or with a, with a very low probability, a sample is going to pass by here and is going to tell me, well, collect a point here, right? You can see already with the confidence intervals from the GP. So points where the 
solution is, is may still be good. Points where I still have a large enough uncertainty are points most likely for a sample of the GP to pass by, and therefore uh, points that are really uh, that I will be sampling, right? Any question? Do you see any Do you see any problem with 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 this acquisition function apart from from being from being random? Sorry. It will always explore. Well, you can think about, well, if, if we start collecting, if we reduce uncertainty here and here, and then uh, the uncertainty is small here, we may have samples that only just pass by, by these points. But that, 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 that can be a problem, but it's, that should be OK in practice. But there is another problem that I'm not telling you. I'm lying to you. Uh, well, mm, th that can be. Uh, so you mean in terms of generating the samples? Yeah, I mean, if, if you have a very large like, um, space, not just uh, one dimensional, if then you need a lot of, of samples, and then you're like, uh, fitting your GP uh, that, you, that you then draw from, in this case, uh, will mm -hmm. be cubic in computation time. And maybe at some point that exceeds your. So the. the, the, the GP is going to be cubic. There are other solutions for that, like using sparse GPs or other approximations. Um, but what I, what I want to highlight here is more, well, so you're going to have that problem anyway, because in each iteration, you are going to draw one sample, optimize that, and update the model. So irrespective of using this or other acquisition function, the complexity that you have of inverting the covariance function in the model is going to be the same. So, but you mentioned something that is, well, you generated, how, how did you generate this sample? How did I generate this sample? <coughs> so that was in one of the labs. You had to generate samples for IGP. What were you doing? Generate you generate a multivariate Gaussian, right? So you are selecting some points here, right? A grid of points. You marginally gener generate a sample from a multivariate Gaussian, right? And then I'm lying to you because that's exactly what I did. And then I connected the points. I'm telling you that this is something continuous, right? OK, this is OK if we use this in one dimension. But so what happened in 10 dimensions, right? Can I do that in 10 dimensions? Can I generate a grid of points and then pretend that I'm generating something continuous, a continuous sample of the GP? Why am I lying to you? Because this sample is not continuous, right? So, so the thing is that generating continuous samples from a GP is not a trivial thing. It's very easy to marginalize the GP in a finite set of points and sample from the multivariate Gaussian, right? And that's exactly what I did here. But if you really want a continuous sample, you need to go a bit deeper into the theory of what is going on in the GP. You need to go to the covariance operator, and you need to think about the eigenfunctions of the covariance operator for that. So if you think about what, so in, in, in the, the first day of the summer school, uh, Rich and Neil were mentioning the connections between uh, Bayesian linear regression and Gaussian processes, right? So you can see, or you can think about the Gaussian process like Bayesian linear regression in which you have infinitely many features and you have Gaussian weights on the features, right? So when you are using a kernel, you are implicitly deciding which is the set of features that we use for representing our process, right? So if what you want to do is to generate samples, or continuous samples from the GP, what you have to do is you have to go to your kernel to do something, to have a look to what eigenfunctions do you have, and to represent samples from the GP by sampling the weights of that feature representation that you have. But when you use a, an exponentiated quadratic kernel, you have infinitely many features, right? So what are we going to do? Are we going to sample from these infinitely many vector uh, to represent our continuous sample? What you do is an approximation. What you do here is, and this is for stationary kernels, is stationary kernels, you can you can study the explicit representation of your function in what people call the like Kahunenloeb representation of the function. 
you approximate some of the eigenfunctions and you sample from the approximate representation. In other words, what you say, you have some information about how the eigenfunctions of the kernel look like, you select some of them at random, you generate random weights with a, you generate enough random weights to have a good enough approximation of the sample of the GP. So what I'm doing here is, well, this I'm doing it by sample simply in the space and generating for the multivariate Gaussian. That's not what you do in a real case where you want to use this acquisition. You need to go a bit deeper. You need to have a look to the Bognet theorem, sample from the eigenfunctions, and compute approximate samples of the GP if you want to use this acquisition in a continuous way. Yeah, so you are, you are sampling from the, so you are adapting these weights. So this, the distribution of the weights change when you have a look to the, to the process in the, in the posterior. Yeah? It may be, but I'm, I'm not aware of, of, of any method to doing that particularly. More questions? OK. So that was uh, this just another acquisition function. Um, last acquisition function. There, there are many. We, could, we can spend the, the entire day. There are as many acquisition functions as uh, families in Game of Thrones, and they all want to be uh, the best and, and, and rule everyone. But the truth is that in the, I every different problem, different acquisition function may work. This is the last one I'm going to discuss. This is. Um, Entropy search and predictive entropy search. So entropy search was first proposed by Philip Henning um, um, co and co-authors. And then there was a different approximation proposed by, by Jose Miguel. Um, so the idea of entropy search is to come up with what is called a non-local uh, acquisition function. So when you think about the expected improvement, when you compute the expected improvement in a particular location in the domain, the only thing that you need is the distribution of the, the marginal distribution of the GP in that location, right? That's fine, but maybe what you want to do is also to use what is happening in other regions in the domain, right? So you want to make a particular decision about the value of the acquisition using the global information that you have about your function. And that's what you do with entropy search. So can you remember from the, from the beginning of the presentation, we have this probability distribution that is the induced probability distribution over the minimum of the functions. Of the, of, the, of, the, of the minimum of, of the function. So we have a probability measure of the GP. This is the induced uh, probability measure over the minimum of the GP, which doesn't have closed form. So you need to do necessary approximations to compute it. And a way of doing that is what we did at the beginning. We were generating samples from the GP, um, um, computing the histogram, right? And now I told you how to generate continuous samples from the GP. So now you know how to do this. And you could say, well, now I have the, an approximation of the distribution of the minimum of the Gaussian process. I can just go on here and uh, here and say, well, this is the, this is the mode of the, of the distribution. So I should collect the next point here. Yes, you could do that. But you can do things that are even smarter than that, which is basically this expression here. What you can do is to say, well, actually, I want something that is very, very informative about the distribution of the minimum. That means that I want to have the distribution that is as spiky as possible, right? So you can compute the entropy of the distribution over the minimum. And what you can do is to select the point in the domain that maximally is going to reduce the entropy of the distribution over the minimum, right? So this is the distribution over the minimum given the current data set. And this is the expected reduction in entropy that you will have by selecting a new point in the domains located at x, right? The problem with this expression here is that require approximations, and those two papers are basically proposing, given the same expression that you have over here, different type of approximation of it. That's, that's, that's the difference. So, and it's not local because it's using the entire distribution. Uh, it's not enough having just the marginal distribution of the GP at a point, as it happens with respect to improvement or other acquisitions. You need to have the full distribution over the minimum and use it to see how the reduction in entropy is going to happen. Right? It's a very sophisticated and very, very interesting uh, acquisition function. 
this is just more of what I said before, the distribution over the minimum, and this is just a, how you can use Thompson sampling to generate samples, approximate it, and, and use it for, for collecting a new, a new evaluation. Right? So this is just a, um, a figure that I got from, from that paper over there, 2013. The only thing I want, I mean, you can, you can generate this in the, in, the, in the lab later as well, or, or, or something similar to this. Um, this is just a particular problem. Uh, I don't even remember what problem it is, but I, the only thing that I want to show is that different acquisitions are going to perform differently. Also, bear in mind that when, when you do this type of experiments in, in basic optimization, the experiments are typically very, very, very noisy, right? So really have a look to the error bars of the plots when, when people compare acquisition functions, because if you really want to check what is the best acquisition in an experiment, you really have to do very intensive experiments to, to prove that. Uh, this is just um, another example of how different acquisitions perform differently in, in different problems. Probably you, you, don't, you can't see the details from, from there because they are very small. doesn't really matter because what I want you to show, I, I want to show you with this, with this experiment is like also how you typically present results in, in basic optimization. So you say, so these are functions evaluations, right? So this is a problem. This is a problem that I'm solving. These are function evaluations that I plot in the S axis. In the Y axis, what I typically represent is either the best found minimum that I have or the cumulative regret. So imagine that I know what is the minimum of that function. I compute the distance between my new evaluations and that minimum, the cumulative distance for all the previous evaluations, and that's, that's where I plot, right? So this plot typically means that the lower the curve, the better is the method, right? And I'm not sure if you can see, but you have different problems. You have same acquisitions applied to all the problems. You have different solutions for, for each one of them, right? So that's, that's the idea. So we are here. Now we are ready to do a full loop on Bayesian optimization. So this is the same problem that I started with in the presentation. So the dotted line, line is the function that I want to minimize. Uh, this is the GP, so I have collected one evaluation in the, in, the, in the center of the domain. The yellow line is representing my current best evaluation. And this is the two standard deviation confidence interval in, in the GP, right? So I apply, I, can, I, I, I have this model, I have computed expected improvement. And the, what expected and that's what I'm drawing here. So what I'm drawing is the normalized expected improvement. Just for the sake of, of clarity of visualization, I compute an expected improvement, and I normalize it to the interval 0, 1, and that's what I, what I draw here. So the expected improvement is telling me, look, you, you have collected this evaluation here. I don't want you to collect anything in this interval. Uh, I think some interesting things may be happening here or there, because uncertainty is still very large. So I want you to collect a point to reduce the uncertainty of what is going on with the function in those points of the domain. So we could select any of these or these points. We are just selecting the extreme in the interval. So we collect that. Now we see that the acquisition function is reducing. It's telling us, look, in this interval, I don't think anything is going to happen in this interval anymore. So you can basically forget about that. But still, there are some other locations that may be interesting to sample. We go to the other extreme. Now we have these two bumps, right? So we have collected kind of symmetric information. We have a point in the center and a point in each, one, in each one of the extremes. Look already how smart the method is, because the region that the acquisition is discarding here is smaller than the region that the acquisition is discarding here. And the reason why that is happening is because the evaluation of the function here is way higher than that one. So the acquisition is realizing that probably things are not happening in this interval, right? And now we have those top bumps. I select a point there, and now is where the magic comes, right? Because now when I select this point because the uncertainty is still large, whoa, because I got a point that is really good compared to other points that I have collected before, the acquisition is telling me, wait, 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 wait. I think the interesting stuff is happening in this region, right? So now, you don't have to collect any more points in that region of the domain. You should just focus on what is happening there. 
So you collect a few more evaluations, and I think in eight or 10 evaluations, you hit the minimum of the function just by following step by step what the acquisition function is telling you, right? So we are done. We could have solved this problem as we discussed at the beginning of the presentation by doing a very fine grid on this point in the domain. We could have solved this problem by sampling points in this domain, right? But instead what we have done, we have built this probabilistic model that represents our uncertainty about the function and our uncertainty about the minimum of the function. And we have followed what this object called expected improvement, this acquisition function is telling us about it. So iteratively, we have saved many evaluations of the function by simply putting this information in the loop when, when collecting the points, right? So that's it. That's an illustration of, of how Bayesian optimization works. So from a more general perspective, you can think about Bayesian optimization like a way of mapping two problems, right? So you are mapping uh, original problem that is unsolvable, unsolvable in the sense that we don't have closed form. We, have, we are in this very tragic situation in which we don't even know how the function looks. We, we can just collect a few evaluations from them. We can transform that in a series of decision problems that we can solve. And the reason why we can solve is that, well, we, now you can tell me, yeah, but you are changing one optimization problem by many optimization problems, right? So what's the game? So the reason is that I really know how to solve these optimization problems, right? I can use everything I know from classical optimization methods to solve these problems here, which is something that I cannot apply directly here, right? Why? Because these acquisitions are typically inexpensive to evaluate. We have gradients. Um, the only thing we need to find is where the maximum of these guys are, OK? OK, so this is kind of the fifth part of the, of the presentation. What time is it? OK. Um, do you have any question? So when you turn the unsolvable problem into a sequence of solvable problems, do you re-optimize your hyperparameters every time? Yes. So you re-optimize the hyperparameters of the, of the GP, uh, especially at the beginning of the optimization, because they have a lot of influence. Something you can do is that, that, that that's a very interesting question because you say, well, you are solving this optimization problem, right? And now you are fitting a GP and you have to solve another optimization problem that is fitting the hyperparameters of the GP. So what is going on here? So remember that one of the reasons that I, po one of the things that I pointed out is that when I had the slide about Bayesian optimization, it was Mocus 1978, right? Actually, you don't optimize the hyperparameters of the GP you do MCMC over them. So you integrate them out. And the reason why these techniques are popular now and they were not popular in the 70s is because we didn't have very good methods to integrate out hyperparameters in methods. So you don't optimize the hyperparameters, you integrate them out. And that's what stops the loop of having another optimization problem in there, right? That does answer your question? Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 So in, in, you you need to bound that in a way. Something something you can do is, if you don't know the domain where 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 your optimum is, you can start with a very large domain. You start with a very big exploration phase, you reduce that until you, you, you need to bound that in a way. You, can, you cannot apply it in, in Rn because that's going to be too big. I mean, you will never stop because you will keep exploring, exploring beyond an interesting region, right? So you need to find ways of bounding it, solving the problem, and then focus on, on, focus on more on an interesting region. But this, there, there, there are a couple of papers tackling that, and that's basically what they do. They say, well, if you don't know where your optimum is, start with something that is large enough, but not too, too big, and start reducing it down. More questions? Yeah, hunting? What is happening when a searching space is tall and gasping? So basically, you don't really have that continuous problem there. And we have this like des desperate point somewhere in a, in a searching space. Do you actually give each of them a, a Gaussian estimation, or do you actually use a single Gaussian which passes all these uh, 
Yeah. So you mean when when you have a when you want to do optimization a finite set? Yeah. So all all, all these apply. So um, that's uh, that's connected what what you do in in bandits problem. So when you have armed bandits, um, what what you have is a finite set in which you you play this game of minimizing the the regret. And uh, you have to choose what arm of the bandit you want you want to play. It's very similar to what you are saying. So that problem has been uh, widely analyzed in the arm bandit uh, context. But all the theory that you have here automatically translate to that case by simply changing the input space and marginalizing the input space in some finite locations instead of optimizing this continuous function. The only thing you have to do is to compute expected improvement in the locations where you are interested in the finite set and then t to take the R max and that's your next evaluation so you just need to restrict the continuous um, the theory that you have for the continuous set here to mar and marginalize it to, to the finite set for each choice you have a Gaussian distribution yeah. Which is the marginal distribution of that location of the, of the GP. More questions? Sorry, with the assumption with the continuous continuity. Yeah. Has there been any work relating that to the less strong form? Oh, yeah. The, the, there are, the, so that's, a, so that's a, a condition that you need when you want to prove the theory that you have in the, la, in the upper confidence bound acquisition function. You can, you can really bound that because you are making that assumption. Uh, but you can relax that. You can have things like uh, non-stationary process where you need a. Uh, that's that's an assumption that you make about the model. So the same assumption that you are making about the model and how would you model that function is the same assumption that is going to work for the for the for the optimization. So yeah, you can you can have other things as well. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> so we are, we are going to discuss some some of those. Uh, I I think the the main pathological case is well when you have non stationarities that's hard because having a, a model reflecting that is possible, but having enough data to make that model work is what what's difficult. And in Bayesian optimization, you typically work on cases where you 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 are you are in very low data regimes. So how much structure that you put in your model before doing the optimization is a very tricky question because the more structure you put, you can help the optimization. But if, if you made a mistake about the physics or the problem or something like that, nothing is going to work. I, I would say that the most interesting case is what happened when I, when I have higher dimensions, right? So with Gaussian processes, we have this effect that when we use a stationary kernel, basically what we are doing is to model correlations about the points that we have evaluated, right? Like, so you say, well, in this first case, because I have a, 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 um, an, a square exponential kernel here, I have collected this point. So the GP knows what is happening in this ball around the point, right? But this, this is fine in one dimension, but as soon as I am in dimension 10, the problem is that if I want to model correlations, I have all these points around and the volume that I'm occupying, the volume that the that in which the, the volume from the total hypercube where I'm doing the stemization in which I really explain in correlation is very small. So I end up doing some sort of random search, right? So a big part of the research that is done in Bayesian optimization now is well, how do I put a structure to relax that? To have models that allow me to generalize and 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 uh, and how can those models help me to avoid that, that, that pathology. Yeah. More questions? Yep. So generally speaking, is there a way to decide like how many rounds or how many loops that you will need to actually make you know, the optimal or suboptimal or so So you can, you can think about uh, some uh, stopping uh, criteria, but typically what people do is do as many as you can. <laughs> More questions? No? Okay. Yeah, uh, sir. When you explained about you could get a continuous uh, sample from your model, uh -huh. so what you, you did this, you basically obtained like a continuous function for the covariance, something like that? 
Yeah, so you, what you do is you, you, do an you, you, you use an approximate representation of the model through the eigenfunctions of the kernel that you sample randomly um, and you use approximate sam you, you samples from that approximate models to approximate samples from your original GP. Make sense? I can give you the details okay. if, if you want. More questions? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I'm gonna discuss that. Yeah. More questions? No. Okay. So let's move ahead. So before going to to some extensions, we we won't have time to cover all those, but I will be around during the day. You you want to ask me? Um, so I want to show you some 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 of the black magic of using Bayesian optimization. All this looks very nice, but when you want to use this in practice, there are some things that you need to take into account, right? Um, so this is something we discussed following some of the questions. So the, the, the model matters a lot. Uh, you have to take care of the hyperparameters of the model, and you can do that by, by MCMC or by other methods uh, from which you can sample from the parameters. I was, I was lying to you. Ha, you didn't tell me anything. I was telling you optimizing the acquisition function this is very easy. We can do that. Guys, look at this. So this is, this is a crazy object. I mean, this is just one dimension, right? But this is super multimodal, right? So remember the first day we were discussing, oh, that we have the likelihood of the GP. We, and remember that this plot that Rich was showing you, like, well, I optimized the model. It's exactly the same model, the same data. And I hit the two different regimes in the likelihood. And now I have this model that really fits and this model that is saying that everything is uncertainty, right? This is an optimization problem and dimension three that is multimodal. If you are solving an optimization problem with Bayesian optimization in dimension 10, your acquisition function is going to be a crazy object, right? And you still need to optimize it. And then you have to put everything, everything that you know about optimization, you have to put it there. Everything you know about the problem, you have to put it there. You have to start running local optimizers in many different points, exploring the domain. So this, no one talks about this. No one talks about this. But this is very important when you run Bayesian optimization, right? So if you come up with a new acquisition, uh, pay attention to this bit and check that you are doing these things right. Because you may think that your acquisition is not working, and it may be simply that you are not solving these problems correctly. So that's a, that's a warning. And yeah, so um, we also discussed this. That is the the dimension of the problem, right? Yeah. Not not necessarily. So it's you, you model you the exactly the same theory applies. So you just have your GP, your multidimensional GP and you compute the gradients from the acquisition, the, the acquisition is defined exactly the same way. So nothing, nothing really changes. So I just use one-dimensional one example for illustrative purposes, but uh, nothing stops you from using them in multiple dimensions. You may have the problem if, I mean, but be aware that if the dimension is very high, you may have the problem. It may not work as you expected, but that's the only thing. The, the way you optimize expected the improvement? improvement. Yeah. Uh -huh. That discussed techniques for optimizing those functions. Yes, so, so there are some discussions on how you, well, how you optimize expected improvement, which initial points should you consider to optimizing it? Uh, should you start from the points that you have collected already, for instance, or you should it? Yeah, there are some discussions of that. No, I, I don't think not as much as it impacts the solution of the problem, because there isn't much theory that you can do about it. So people tend to focus on other research aspects of, of base O, but that's a very important one in practice. Yeah. OK, so this is, a, so this is a, so some issues. Um, how do you deal with the hyperparameters of the model? How do you initialize the model? And how do you optimize the acquisition? So this is what we have been discussing. So this is just a way of uh, illustrating what I was mentioning before. How do you integrate? the acquisition function with respect to some uh, points that you have that you have already that you have already collected so these are just different samples of the gp for different hyperparameters and 
you are integrating the acquisition with respect to the hyperparameters. And this column, what this plot is showing is how you can integrate the acquisition function with respect to some pending evaluations that you may have. In this case, instead of integrating them with respect to the prior that you have in the hyperparameter, you integrate them with respect to the Gaussian distribution that corresponds to those pending locations. Imagine that you have failures in those locations. And imagine that you are running experiments in those locations. And in your next decision, you went to integrate that out. So that's, that's what you would do. How do you initialize the model? That's interesting. Uh, so you can simply start with one point. But you know that at the beginning, you are going to start with a, with a, with a big exploration phase, right? At the beginning, you just want to collect global information about the function. So the reason why you want to start with, instead of just collecting points one by one, at the beginning, you want to start maybe with a big random design and later start with basic optimization iterations, is that this type of high discrepancy sequence are crazily parallelizable, right? So if you think about drawing random points, you can draw many random points, evaluate your function in parallel in those random points, collect global information. That is going to be more or less what you would be doing at the beginning of the optimization in the exploration phase. And then you start running base of sequences, right? Base of uh, iterations. And you have you can you can do that uniformly, Latin designs, you can halt on sequences, and you can use a particular type of processes that I really like that are determinantal point processes. So I just included two slides. I, I think I'm going to skip this um, because I have 10 minutes and there are other interesting things that, that I want to mention. OK, and this is just the third bit that I was mentioning about how do you optimize the acquisition function. You can use uh, gradient-based algorithms with multiple starting points, or you can use uh, lichid-based heuristic like um, dividing rectangles algorithm. Uh, evolutionary algorithms like covariance matrix adaptation, what is said before, pretty much anything that you use about optimization, uh, standard optimization, you can use it there. So these are different topics I, I wanted to discuss, but unfortunately, I won't have time to discuss them. So I'm going to touch just uh, a couple of them, and then I want to uh, finish with a, with a, with a couple of, of interesting applications of, of Bayesian optimization. So uh, I think that I'm going to talk about the multitask based on optimization. So someone was asking before, OK, what happens if I have multiple objectives? right? So there are two things that can happen here. One is, well, I have two objectives that I want to optimize at the same time. So imagine that I'm building an engine. And what I want to do is to build the engine in a way that is very, very efficient in terms of the, of the fuel that is consuming. But it's also very, very fast. So you can probably do both. So you need to find a compromise. right? So in those cases, uh, you can use Bayesian optimization by learning what is called a Pareto front. It's a, 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 a family of solutions, of, of non-dominant solutions that is called. Um, um, I will mention how to do that. But there are other cases, um, and there are some papers on this, in which so imagine that you are optimizing a function that is very expensive to evaluate, but you have another function that is very cheap to evaluate that is correlated to the previous one. Right? So now what you can do, if you remember the talk uh, that Mauricio gave yesterday about multi-output Gaussian processes, you can build a multi-output Gaussian processes for these two functions, uh, evaluate the one that is cheap, and transfer the information to the one that is expensive. So you can use a cheap function to optimize the, to optimize the expensive one. Uh, as I mentioned, you can do this with a, with a multi-output Gaussian processes for the, for the two objectives. And this is a figure that <laughs> helps to illustrate what is going on. So imagine that we have these three functions. Uh, these three functions are, uh, you see, patterns of, of correlation in them. Imagine that we are interested in optimizing this one. right? So imagine what, what we do, this is just for illustrative purposes, we fit three independent Gaussian processes to the three functions. right? So basically, uh, this function doesn't really care about what is happening with these other two. I collect points in this part of the domain. I fit a GP, and I get this uncertainty in the, in the function that I'm trying to optimize. I compute the expected improvement, and I decide that my next evaluation is happening here. Right? But if I link the three functions through a multi-output GP, 
And I use the correlation that I have between the three of them, and I assume that I have collected enough points in the other two functions that I assume are, are cheaper and more accessible for me. Through the multi-output GP, if I use the uncertainty that now I have in my function of interest, I have a totally different acquisition function, and I will be evaluating the function in a completely different point. Right? So this is a way of using uh, multi-output Gaussian processes for optimization when I have a very expensive function that I cannot touch or that is very expensive to evaluate, but I have a, some sort of surrogate of that function that is very cheap. So I can link those two with a multi-output Gaussian process and then uh, proceed with the, with, the, with the optimization. So that's, that's something I, I wanted to talk about. Uh, I'm going to skip this one. Um, I'm going to skip this one. I want to talk about this. So something I think is, is very interesting. So, um, so we were saying you can use different acquisition functions, and all of them are a way of balancing exploration and exploitation, right? So there is an automatic way of deciding at each point in the optimization which is the optimal exploration exploitation criteria, right? And this is thinking non myopically about the problem, right? So, so imagine that imagine this that we have this example, right? So imagine that we have a function that we want to optimize in this interval, right? And we don't have any information about the function. As we did with our previous example, if we only have one evaluation to know about the minimum, what we would probably do is to go and collect that point in the center of the interval, right? If once I've collected this point in the center in the, of the interval, I tell you that you have another evaluation that you can, you can collect, what you will do is, and many optimization techniques do this, you will collect a second point in the center of one of the two remaining sub-intervals, right? Okay, we did this because we are collecting points one by one, right? But if from the, be if from the very beginning you knew that your budget is two evaluations, you will have never collected the points like this. What you would have done is to collect the points distributed across, across the domain, right? So this is a way of illustrating that thinking myopically, thinking on collecting the next evaluation one by one can be suboptimal if we know the exact budget that we have before we need to report our result, right? So this is uh, another of the pathologies that we can, we can consider in Bayesian optimization and in, in most use acquisition function that is that they are myopic. They are based all the decision they are making, assuming that I only have one remaining evaluations to provide me my solution, right? So to solve this, you need to incorporate the budget. You need to incorporate the information about the budget that you have to change the policy that you take, right? So imagine that you are finishing your paper for NIPS, and you have two hours, and you have to train your model, and you have to report your results, right? And you know that you have two hours to report your results. Thinking non myopically about the problem will be to use an optimization problem that you know in two hours is going to give you the best result, right? So think about the example of the, of the restaurant, right? So you go to your favorite restaurant, and if you know that you are going to be living in that city for many more years, you can allow yourself to explore new things, right? But if you know that that's going to be the last time you are going to be in that restaurant, what you are going to order is your favorite food. You are not going to explore anything, right? Because you know that you will never be there again. So thinking non myopically about the problem is a way of incorporating and automatically the exploration exploitation trade-off according to how many remaining evaluations I have. If I am far from the horizon in which I have to report my results, I can be more explorative. If I am close to the moment in which I have to provide my result, I'm going to be more, more exploitative. So when you incorporate this idea of putting in the decision the budget that I have, you see that acquisition functions show an automatic balance between exploration and, and exploitation. And I, I think that that's very interesting. So this is something that we did. Um, so it was, we, the method we call glasses, relieving the myopia of Bayesian optimization, that was the paper. And uh, we see global optimization with look ahead through a stochastic simulation and expect to loss search. This is the best acronym ever for, <laughs> for, for a paper, I think. So, that, so the, idea, the idea of the paper is simply 
So we have to predict when we want to think non myopically, we have to predict which are the future steps of our algorithm because we have to integrate those back when making the decisions. And what we did was to put some prior probability distribution over the future steps. I can explain you the details and, and integrate that out. So basically, I had many other things I wanted to talk about, but given that I have uh, zero minutes, um, I want to show you some applications. So I want to show you this video, a couple of applications. I want to show you this video. This is from Roberto Calandra, Mark Dyson Roth, and um, collaborators. So they were using Bayesian optimization to optimize um, uh, a robot that was working. So, um, so basically, they, they have a, a robot. You will see it. The robot was working. They wanted to optimize the stability of the robot, right? According to some parameterization of uh, the way the robot is working, right? So that, that's, a, that's a bipedal robot. Uh, that's what they wanted to get, basically. Um, I don't think this is the video I want to show, but it's okay. Uh, so let me see. Um, sorry, uh, I think, no, this is the video. So I, they applied Bayesian optimization to optimize So during optimization, yeah. So the robot is failing, right? The robot is failing at the beginning. So they have a Gaussian process model to map the configuration of how the robot works to the stability and the speed of the, of the robot. So the robot is, is learning. So every time the robot starts to work, they collect a new evaluation. And after a few trials of the robot using Bayesian optimization, they manage to make the robot work very, very fast. So in this experiment, they can not allow themselves to use many evaluations. You don't have an explicit way of mapping the configuration of the robot to how fast it works. But, um, yeah, and, and they did it with Bayesian optimization, and it worked very, very well for them. Um, something I want to mention. So we have been also using uh, Bayesian optimization. When I was postdoc here in, in Cephil, we were using Bayesian optimization to uh, optimize synthetic genes. We were optimizing genes that we were putting in cells to overproduce certain certain proteins of interest. So we basically had a surrogate model for the cell, for how the cell was working. Um, um, we were using that to design physical experiments. We were designing physical genes, putting them in cells, and improve uh, the amount of uh, proteins that cells were, were producing, a particular type of cells. <coughs> Um, uh, so we were transforming natural cells in, in mini factories, and we were controlling their behavior and optimizing their behavior using using Bayesian optimization. So there, are, uh, in the slides, I have other other things I wanted to talk about, but I don't have time for that. So just as I wrap up, so I, I hope this helped you to understand how you can use Gaussian process and how you can use uncertainty for making uh, informed decisions. In this case, informed decisions that will help you to find the minimum of, of, of a function of interest. Remember, there are two key elements in Bayesian optimization. One is the model. It's very important. You need to have the right model. You need to put in the model the knowledge that you have about your problem. And then you can define many different types of acquisition functions. You can go for very fancy and interesting things, I think, that are uh, non-local, like entropy search. You can go from, from non-myopic things. There are many extensions in Bayesian, in Bayesian optimization. You can use Bayesian optimization in hierarchical input spaces when you have conditional dependencies. You can, you can, you can do early stopping. So imagine that in each evaluation, you have an inner loop because this corresponds to an algorithm that you are optimizing and you want to stop that and allocate the courses differently. There is a, there is a vast literature nowadays in Bayesian optimization covering different type of, of interesting problems. So if you, if you like the method, uh, I encourage you to, to have a look to it. And I just want to finish with, uh, with some announcement. So in NIPS, we have a workshop. So if you like the presentation, we have a workshop in, in, in NIPS about Bayesian optimization. You are more than welcome.